All right. Ready. Let's do it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is the CEO of Ritholtz Wealth Management. He's a commentator on CNBC. He's a blogger on the Reformed Broker. He's the chairman of the FinTwitch Federal Reserve. He's downtown Josh Brown. We're going to talk I'm to a, him. I'm a member of the Avengers. <laughs> uh, you're leaving some of this stuff out. I, don't, I feel like the viewers should get all of it. I'm going to read your Wikipedia entry right after this. <laughs> Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. What's up, Tobias? How are you? Everything good? I mean, thanks so much for coming on and doing this. My pleasure. Uh, first question, your, your own personal investment strategy. I've read your great post, How I Invest My Own Money. Um, and that's that. That's you, you, you've got a very sensible approach, of course, because you're a financial planner. But uh, when you're when you're thinking about the most interesting thing for me in that list is the individual stocks, the individual names. When you're when you're thinking about choosing those names, how, how do you go about doing that? What do you? What's your what's your process? So I started trading stocks when I was like 18, and I just I I just I love it. But I don't trade really anymore. Well, you said Most you buy what- and you don't sell. I try. I mean, sometimes if I sell something, it's because I went into it with a stop loss. Like I went into it saying, all right, I'm willing to take 10 percent downside to make 30 percent upside. Like, but for the most part, what I'm doing is buying and having the dividends be automatically reinvested. So it's a lot of blue chips, a lot of like large cap growth stocks. And I already have a lot of exposure to some of these stocks anyway, because they're big in the, the indices. And my real money is invested in like my my firm's models. So I have exposure to all this stuff already. So these are just names that I want to own individually, and I will only do it in uh, I will only do it in um, tax deferred accounts. So I'm not doing any individual stocks or bonds or anything in a brokerage account. So I'll roll over IRA, SEP IRA, etc. Um, but what I'm basically trying to do is like make sure that I'm staying on top of what's going on with the individual names. And so the mechanism by which I do that is having some skin in the game. Um, I'm not looking to change my life with individual stocks. Like my, my real investment is in this firm. And then my, my secondary real investment is in my retirement account, which again owns the same models that my clients own. So this is really just something on the side that I'm doing like to keep myself sharp and plugged in and engaged. So I have a bunch of stocks that I bought years and years ago. I've never sold them like Apple and uh, all this stuff, and they've just gone up and up and up. Um, and I just I follow the news because I have a little bit, you know, more uh, invested in, in in these companies. But I'm not like measuring alpha versus a benchmark. I don't care about that stuff. Um, and then a lot of the stuff I own is like boring, and I like it that way. So you know, I'm in Verizon. I'm in, you know, I'm in a bunch of REITs, and like these are things that are just. Paying dividends, accumulating more stocks, slow and steady, and and uh, it makes me happy. I like to watch that process happen in my accounts. In Verizon, to make the cable payments a little bit less painful. Well, that's a good point. A lot of stocks I own, just not on purpose, but by default, are companies that I spend money with. Um, like I own Duncan, I own Shake Shack. I've done really, really well with those stocks. I spend money there. Like I feel like I should be getting something back, and I actually think that that's a really good tool. Um, it's the Peter Lynch. Yeah, it's a little bit. So uh, I think I feel like Peter Lynch got kind of miss. I mean, I'm sure you've read the, the same books that that I read. I feel like he said like that's a good starting point, and people took that to mean like, oh, just buy whatever I'm a customer of. Um, but I think there's some element of that, and it's also like it's a great reminder, like when you had the volatility that we had a week, a week and a half ago. You see stocks go down 9% in four days or three days. And you're just like, yeah, but I know the business didn't decline in value by 9%. These are just the pieces of paper that represent that business. So it's a helpful reminder when you own stocks where you actually interact with those companies in the real world because you realize, oh, I'm still probably going to pay my Verizon bill 
uh, next month, like most likely, I'm still going to get a cup of coffee uh, this morning when I wake up. Like, I think that that's a, an interesting psychological tool. Harder to do that with things that are a little bit more divorced from your life, like semiconductor stocks or, uh, you know, railroads or, or, or things that you're not directly interacting with all the time. I think Peter Lynch said, find the things that you use every day and then the things that you like and then do a valuation and then buy them if the valuation is sensible. Right. People, people didn't like the valuation part. They just well, skipped to That hasn't just worked. To buy it. Right. If you, if well, you, might, actually, it might have worked. I use an iPhone every day. If you I cut out know. the valuation step, I think you've done better over the last five years. I, I, the, uh, I there's an ETF ACSI Australia, uh, Australia uh, American Consumer something basically what they look they look at uh the data that point of sale data for people who are buying these things and then they they extrapolate that out and go and buy those underlying stocks so they're trying to get ahead of the the next earnings and there's a there's a uk version or a european version and a us version and the uk or european version they try to do a valuation before they buy it and the Amer- <laughs> well, it, it's underperformed the american version that doesn't worry about the valuation just buys it on right. sort of pure underlying earnings momentum so uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote i wrote a post about that phenomenon i, I said uh i'm talking about price to book and I, and I basically said like there are no asset managers who put in their literature or sit in front of a client anything to the effect of here's what we do we buy the biggest winning stocks and we add to them as they win even more, and we pay absolutely no attention to valuation. There was nobody saying that that's their process. Had you spent the last 10 years doing that, you absolutely fucking destroyed everyone else who's like, oh, we're looking for value, and we're looking for bargains, and the, the idiot who just buys the SPY, they're like, well, what the fuck are you doing that for? <laughs> You're not making any money doing that, so is this like a pride thing? Um, so I, I'm not joking like this is going to go on forever, but I just think it's interesting that we've been in that sort of moment for more than a couple of years. It's been going on for like almost 10 years now. Well, it's, a moment, it stops. it's a momentum strategy, right? It's a legitimate momentum strategy. And we've, we've both got friends, uh, Alpha Architect, Wes Gray and AQR. They have, they have explicit momentum strategies where they're buying the things that have gone up the most. And that's a, that's a, a very good long-term well-performed strategy over very long term it's got better risk adjusted characteristics than value does particularly at the moment you know what's different about this though this is like the same momentum stocks for 10 years do you understand what i mean by that like I, this is when you, when most people think of momentum historically they think of like ebbs and flows in sectors and one name is hot for a year and then it gets killed but there's another hot name this is like a small collection of companies that, and it's not just stock price momentum. They have, they have fundamental momentum. Right. Like they have the earnings growth that is justifying, maybe it doesn't justify like valuation, but at least justifies the ongoing compounding year after year of these stock prices. It's not like the fundamentals are shit or they're, or they're, or they're low quality. They're the highest quality companies in the country. They have like unbelievable, uh, earnings power. They have an endless array of levers they could pull. When one part of their business starts to slow down, they pull another lever or they go into another vertical and the whole process starts all over again. We just fucking watched Amazon invent the third largest advertising business in America overnight. Like they just, people are like, oh, you'll see web services, the cloud, it's going to start to slow. And they're like, all right, we're an advertising company now. It becomes the third largest advertising platform in 12 months. People are like, wait, what? Well, hold on. They're growing earnings 25% again? How are they doing that? Um, and they do this over and over and over and over again. And I'm not suggesting it goes on ad infinitum, but it's like this is what's unique about this moment is that it's a small group of companies seemingly able to do this, whereas momentum historically was like, Oh, that's like a biotech. They got an FDA approval. It's been hot for six months. Oh, that's like a an oil company. They discovered a new well. Stock's been making new highs every week, and you know it'll peter out eventually. When does this stop? So I think part of the answer to that is um, is cheap money. I've tried to draw that parallel, uh, but it's not. Ju- it can't be just that. 
Like I'm very wary of people that have a single explanation for something this big. Well, what it's about be there's, there's one suggestion that it's uh, that the, there's been less enforcement of uh, antitrust. Yeah, I buy that. I buy that because if somebody stops Facebook from buying Instagram in 2012, so they did, I think they did it like a month before they came public or something. If somebody stops that in its tracks, arguably Instagram, uh, I don't know that it ever gets as big as it is now because Facebook gave it access to its social graph, which supercharged its growth. But could it be bigger than Twitter, 300 million users? Yeah. Could it be bigger than LinkedIn, 600 million users? Probably. It could. I'm not saying it would. Certainly it would be bigger than Snap. So if that's a standalone company, it's worth $40 billion and it's pulling ad dollars away from Facebook the way uh, other social networks are trying to or have failed. Yeah, that's argue. And then what's Facebook's growth? X Instagram. What's negative? No way. Yeah, there's no way it looks like what it's looked like over the last three years. So I think there's I think there's probably something to that. Um, but not only are we not enforcing antitrust, we're we're doing like after the horses leave the barn, we're starting to get concerned about this stuff. Like like after it's too late, you know. And now I think maybe we're at a place where it's too late. Who could really stop these companies? I, I don't know. They're setting up shop in Washington. They're hiring the highest priced lobbying and law firms you can. They're making friends with all the right politicians. No one's going to be able to stop this stuff. So I mean, certainly not this administration. I, I don't. So I. So people are like, well, when when is this going to end? Uh, I don't know. Um, so I don't know if that's actionable as an investor, but I just feel like uh, it's hard for me to understand why somebody would buy Macy's stock right now, knowing what I know about what Amazon wants to do with apparel, which they are not hiding. They've been very open about what their what their ideas are about the apparel market. Um, so now you look at something like Macy's stock was sixty dollars four years ago. It's nineteen dollars as we're recording. Six billion dollar market cap, thirteen billion dollars in enterprise value. It's a lot of debt. It's trading six times forward earnings. So, <laughs> if you're running one of these screens and you're like, I want to own the cheapest stock, uh, it's trading four times last year's earnings or whatever it is. So that's going to end up in your bucket unless you're doing some kind of a debt screen. Like, okay, so. So I understand historically it's cheap. It's you're a contrarian. I'm so impressed. Blah, blah. Okay, you fucking buy it. You bu- go buy Macy's. Tell me, tell me how this story ends. Maybe you'll be right, or maybe there'll be a short squeeze and it'll rally twelve percent and you'll take that profit. I don't know, but it's just like that's like one example. There are like hundreds of those examples in the market right now. And yes, I understand things don't go on forever. But it's been a pretty long goddamn time, and on a secular basis, many of these companies are going away. Looking at Bed Bath & Beyond the other day, how is this still around? Who are the <laughs> investors with capital in this stock? There, there's what still they boomers think? shopping there. Well, there, there are activist hedge funds trying to get board seats at fucking Bed Bath & Beyond. Get up. <laughs> you don't need a seat. You need a life raft. So, like, I... I, I'm fascinated by this moment that we're in, and I, I'm not saying like I have the answers, but I think I've come up with some pretty good ways of thinking and writing about it. I agree with you. It's an extremely difficult time. Like I'm a, I'm a value guy. I'm a deep value guy. So I'm a guy who's just missed the entire rally. So I, I, I fully own up to that. And you can, you can look at it in my returns. But I, the, and I, the thing that makes it so hard is that the, the undervalued businesses are really terrible businesses, and the businesses that I really want to own are just. Nosebleed, eye popping yeah. valuation. So there's no entry point for any of these things. It makes what, it difficult. All right, let me ask you this. What is the mechanism by which all of a sudden that would shift and the cheapest businesses start going up and the best businesses that are expensive start falling? Is, is it like a silver bullet type of thing that starts that? Is it one by one or does it never happen? Well, I can tell you that the, the problem, like I can look at my portfolio, my portfolio is public and you can see that you can go to a, a site like Morningstar and look at the growth rate of the underlying stocks. Like the underlying, the growth rate of the underlying stocks is higher than the rest of the market. They're cheap and they're growing faster than the rest of the market, which is not something I typically like. I prefer them to grow slower because those returns are better. That doesn't make any sense, but that's, that's the case. As it happens- You're saying this the, t- the, the dirt cheap stocks are growing faster than the market? Correct. 
So get like, you don't have to say a ticker if you're not allowed to, but like, give me an example. Like in what sector do you find below market valuations with higher than market growth rates? I would need to look at that specifically to, to but I'll, I'll put something into the notes of this one. Uh, but, but across the entire portfolio, that's the case on a, on a, uh, the, the name, the individual names, the revenues, earnings, etc., are growing faster than the market, and they're they're below market valuations. But they still don't get any love. I mean, that's the that's the pain for a value investor. So, if, at the beginning of my career, like the first thing I saw was um, the dot com boom and crash. I wasn't really managing money at the time. I was like a kid. I was like cold calling for brokers who were buying all these tech stocks and IPOs. It was an IPO every day. Some days there were two or three. Um, and none of the companies had, forget the people like, oh, they were expensive. No, no, no. They didn't even have businesses. Right. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like, oh, they were selling 40 times earnings. Uh, how, how egregious. They had no earnings. They had no revenue. They, there was no multiple. You couldn't put a multiple on a company the that per- we don't have any revenue. They had a fucking domain name. It's the so, perfect but business. Fine. But fine. But a lot of them made it into the NASDAQ. And not just the worthless.coms, but... I, I know I'm telling you things you already know, but I'm setting something up here. Like Sun Microsystems and Lucent and Cisco and these companies who were selling equipment to companies that were funded by equity and equity that was outrageously overvalued, but at least all this cash that they raised, they were like buying equipment. So these were like real fundamental businesses that made up the NASDAQ 100. It wasn't like all these fake dot coms. They weren't in that index. Um, but then when the music stopped for all the equity financing and the IPOs went away because the NASDAQ started to crash, all of these companies where people were like, oh, well, I'm investing in a real business like Lucent, they actually earned money. Well, their, their shit went away too because their customers disappeared. Um, right. So, so, but you had, so you had that moment, right? And who looked better 18 months later? So the, the NASDAQ peaks in March 2000. The people who looked better were the people who just their mandate would never have let them own NASDAQ 100 stocks, but they own bowling alleys and, you know, we make Winnebago's and, oh, this stock I'm invested in makes house paint and this is a carpeting company. And this like those stocks look amazing relative to the S&P 500, which had become dominated by tech stocks and or high multiple consumer staples like uh, Coca-Cola and all that. All right. So who owned those stocks? Well, Buffett, but also like David Einhorn and like a lot of the people who became like famous value practitioners, their entire career was made in an 18 month period of time. Right. And that like, so by 2002, if you had a positive track record, which like Berkshire did, um, while the people who had been chasing the NASDAQ names, we're down 70%, 80%. Right. Like that track record in print, you could dine out on that for the next 15 years because there would just be no way for the market to catch up to you. So you would just like, it was like, I feel like that was what, what's called the Cambrian explosion where like all the fossils of all this life were found in one place at one time. <laughs> like that is the origin story of nine out of 10 of the most famous value. Investors. I agree 100%. Okay. okay. So now here's a problem though. 15 years goes by, there was never a repeat of that. In fact, the cheapest stocks got hit the hardest in the next crisis. Right. Next crisis didn't look like dot com. So you had home builders selling at seven times earnings. They end up going to seven times earnings or, or, or three times earnings because those earnings never show up. Um, and then, of course, we find out they're losing money. Banks, mortgage uh, lenders, they were all quote unquote cheap on paper. So a lot of those value investors who looked like geniuses after dot com, there was a little bit of tarnish after the housing price. Okay, it's fine. It's okay. Everyone has drawdowns. Um, but you never had another dot com moment with that much dispersion that would help the value track records. One hundred percent. Hold up to the overall market. So are you going to have that? Like, is that the thing that resurrects all of these funds and all of these strategies and? makes the the research look better on buying cheap stocks like is that going to come along at some point or do we go into the next recession have a market crash and a lot of these quote unquote cheap stocks get just as badly killed as the amazons and the googles and the netflixes 
because that scenario is also feasible. It's highly feasible that some of the cheapest stocks. So I, I understand margin of safety, blah, blah, blah. I just, I'm not convinced that it, that it really will matter. What, what do you think about that? I think that the long-term track record for value is extremely good. Like if you pull, pull down that FAMA French data, which is available on French's website, it's all free. You can pull it down. You can take a look at cash, cash flow to price. I mean, I've, I put it on my blog. I put it on my Twitter all the time. I put it up on Friday. I'll tweet it out again. Um, the long-term track record to that most undervalued portfolio of stocks on a price to cash flow basis equal weighted, which is basically how a lot of value investors are constructing their portfolios. It has more than doubled the return to the more expensive stuff. Over what period of time? Since 1951 for the price to cash flow, since 1928 for the for the What is the longest to- what is the longest stretch? The current the one. The current one is the longest stretch where yes. it's underperformed and the deep, uh, market and, cap benchmark, and the, the, benchmark. The deepest underperformance, yes. So it is both the longest duration of underperformance for value and the worst showing Correct. relative to Correct. For, pr- okay. for price to cash flow on an equal now, basis. So not to be a dick, but like, what if something in the economy has so materially changed relative to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that it, 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 it no longer matters and it will never revert? That, Isn't that, like, does that bother you? 100%. Because we, we, we have funds where um, we're tilting toward value. Like right. we, we are invested in that too, but not all of our money. My but, condolences. Well, I'm saying like, is that something that you think about? That's, that's I think the, about that's, it all the time. That's the singular question. And if you can answer that question correctly, then you're probably a billionaire. Well, I took a stab at it. And my answer to that question is that uh, it is conceivable that the microchip and, and, and the invention of software, and like these things becoming household in the early 80s was a line of demarcation that people in the future will point back at and say that was the moment that everything changed and it took a really long time though for it to take over the economy but once it did it never went back I, like, I, feel, I feel like that's look dude you and i we could be like partners in an investment firm in 1930 and we could be making these really big bets on blacksmiths <laughs> and fucking horseshoes like if that could be us and i don't think they ever got a, a redemption uh moment the, you know the people that were doing that and the automobile fundamentally changed the economy why would it be so inconceivable that software is doing that now it's not inconceivable i, I agree with you 100 percent. and i i would say that the the demarcation point is not just the the computer i think it's the and it's not even the first dot it's the internet or the web and then those network effects finally being built out properly to get to the point now where it becomes winner take all. The only thing that I would say to that though, this is the only saving grace for value that the better risk adjusted I've better. Said this before. Well, this is the only sa- uh, this is the only saving grace for value that the the risk reward. If you're wrong, value's already dead. So you you you're already dead. If you're right. So if you make I don't it, know about, I don't if know you're right, that. the payout is the payoff is huge. A stock that's fallen from from sixty to, to twenty has lost two thirds of its value, but from right. twenty to ten, it loses another half of its value. Like right. I don't, I don't know that you're jump. I I understand what you're saying. You're saying like you're jumping on a basement window at this point because valuations have already come down so much. I you got you could have you have had historically like entire industries where the stocks have gone to zero. And I think there were people saying something similar to what you were saying about steel stocks in the 90s, and they just, they went to zero. There aren't any left. It's U.S. steel. Like, There's people said, like, that, I mean, that predate that time, or they went through reorganization well, that, and came that, back. That, that's fair. That's fair. You know what I'm saying? Like, like people would say, people, like, you forget Bethlehem Steel, how huge and important that company was in America. And somebody that grew up in the 50s and 60s and watched them build the interstate highway system, um, and then like in the 90s to have that be a three dollar stock, it's like inconceivable. And then you had activists come along, like guys come file a 13 D and like, here's how we're going to revitalize. It didn't work. They all went to zero. 
Uh, and the same with most publicly traded coal companies. Um, and so it's like, I don't know, is retail steel? Is retail coal? Because when you do the screens evaluation, you'll find a lot of retailers in there. And I don't really know what they're going to do about it. And, you know, uh, like to me, like that's, I don't have the answer, but I think I know that that is the right question is what if everything is permanently changed? And, you know, it's, I think it's, people are worried about it. I think that's exactly the right question, but I think that that is the question that, I mean, all value investors are asking that question. And if they're not, then they're they're not going to be in the game for very long. Buffett himself has said that retailers are a bad business because there's always some new concept that comes along that just steals all the value from the, whatever the, you know, so the department store killed whatever came before that. And then you needed your department store to be near near a, like a, a tram the tram where people got off the tram because if it wasn't people just weren't going to walk past whatever was the local thing and right. now amazon's the new version of that like it has to be accessible from your desktop because no one's going to walk to the tram stop anymore so buffett really not a value investor um right i think he's a growth at a reasonable price investor i agree and when you look at what ted and todd are buying they're not interested in any of these value stocks they're buying visa mastercard well those are value stocks potentially lol but these are the top momentum stocks in America. Visa, Visa's gone up like a thousand percent in the last five years. Like but, but they're the, buying momentum stocks. I mean, they're not buying it because of the momentum stocks. I understand they like the credit card companies. They, they like the moat. I, I understand that. I'm just saying, like that's what they're buying. That's what these guys are buying. Stocks that are in no way, shape, or form are cheap. Like by any statistical definition of cheap, you could say they're cheap on what their earnings might be two years from now or right. whatever. That would be stretching right. the definition of, of value. But the way that so, they're, they're, they're just looking at what they return on equity, they're looking at that return on equity versus wherever else you can stick your money, like you're basically getting virtually zero. So that then makes the valuation extremely high. Any discount to that is a sensible discount. That's a value, right. that's a value stock. That's a, mod, that's a modern value stock. Like That's a compounder value stock. And anybody who's done that as a value investor has done very well over the last... Five or well, 10 we've, years. Yeah, we've seen some of the value investors kind of move toward that approach. Right. And uh, those are the guys that are still in the game, I guess. Right. Uh, I think the guy from like uh, from Oakmark was buying Amazon or something. Uh, yeah. It's like, so, so like, so, like some of these guys have like changed their definition of value. So arguably like that's been good for their investors. Um, but then like if anything can be a value stock, what is a value stock? Like then, then we end up getting into this whole uh, debate over like uh, doctrinaire definitions of these things that maybe right. shouldn't. No, matter. Nobody cares about those things. Right. Well, I, I guess so. If you're writing a rules-based strategy, though, you do care, right? Like that's the. I guess that's the difference between being discretionary versus quant screen. Right. It's like if you're a quant screen, you get really mad when you hear people like. Well, I'm buying Netflix because actually, if you value it based on blah blah blah, and they're like, I can't do that. Yeah. I got the rules written already. I mean, you know? I, I I do care about. It. I think I think it's a central question, and I think about it a lot. And the, the issue that I have, and I, this is one thing, this is a, a a criticism of mine that I've had that ten de- ten years of of value investors have um, been paid to become more growthy in the way that they invest. And so, if you, but historically, that's not been a great way to do it. So it's either you've got to make this decision and it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult decision to make. You either believe in um, the things that have worked in the past and you bet that way or you recognize that the game has changed and you have to, you have to adapt with that game. And I don't know what the correct answer is. It's sort of, well, it let, remains to be so seen. Let me flip it on its head. Let's pretend you're the end investor. And let's, okay. So I'm a financial advisor. You're a dentist. And I say, Dr. Carlisle, um, Great news, you've compounded at 13% over the last uh, 10 years. So I've done really, really well for you. Um, now do you say to me, yeah, but did you did you buy cheap stocks or did we overpay? Well, we overpaid. Well, Josh, you told me 10 years ago though that you had a discipline and that we were gonna have a margin of safety because you weren't gonna chase the most expensive stocks. And then I say, well, I did, but it worked out in your favor. What do you, what do you say back to me? It presupposes the money's real. You get to keep the money. It presupposes so I, well, bullshitted, I bullshitted you, but the money's real. 
Now, what do you tell me? Well, I, I am the end. I am the end consumer as well as being the manager. So I, I'm I'm intensely interested for a lot of different reasons in the way that the okay. the way that these things work. But the question is not what should I have done over the last ten years. The question is what should I do for the next ten years? And I well, st- yeah, but that's going to inform like how you've spent the last ten years and the lessons you've learned. That will color what people do over the next ten years. Absolutely, because we all because of the recency bias right. and the availability heuristic and. Right. All these things that screw with us, like we're, you're going to act however you act over the next 10 years. It's going to be colored by something that you've just experienced. Me too. Like I, I, I feel like we're human beings. It's, it's unavoidable. Well, I try to resist it by looking at very long-term data. And I don't know that that's helpful, but that's, that's my process. Um, we use this example as a, teacher, as a teaching tool all the time. I'm sure you've heard it before. So there was this thing where if you were an investor um, from like 1917 or whatever, when they first started doing war bonds, like if you were an investor from 1917 until 1957, so it's like 40 something years, uh, 40 years, if you were an investor, you knew that the best time to buy stocks was when the dividend yield of the stock market got over um, the yield of the 10 year treasury. So that was a signal that stocks are now too cheap, must be bought. Um, and you use that and it worked like clockwork. And then you would sell stocks when that reversed. You would say stocks are too expensive, the dividend yield is too low. Um, and then in the late 1950s, for a variety of reasons, interest rates, um, you know, Eisenhower rebuilding the country and all, all these things, all of a sudden that just that one day uh, it stopped working. So one day, the dividend yield of the stock market fell below the 10-year treasury, and it never went back. Like to this day, it has never gone back. Now, if you're one of these people, though, that's like, well, the data going back 40 years says that you sell stocks when the dividend falls below the 10-year, you're still fucking waiting to buy back in. (laughs) Now, nobody in 1957 or 1958 or 1959 or 1960 could have definitively said things have changed permanently. You only know that things had changed permanently with the benefit of time. Okay, so now with all due respect to Fama, French, and Markowitz, and all the theory, with all due respect, the only constant is change. And it is possible that some of these theories and formulas, and frameworks, and rules of thumb that we've constructed trillions of dollars of investing um, um, ability on top of like it is possible that some of the underlying assumptions that we've just taken for granted are no longer valid and it is also possible i'm pointing at the microchip the fuck do i know it could be something that nobody's even thinking of it could be life expectancies that have completely changed the idea of stock market valuation it could be globalization so we've been globalizing for for centuries but like it could be a certain tipping point in globalization where rules change I don't know what the answer is. I only know that we've got to keep it in the back of our minds. And here's where that's scary for me. We're doing a lot of modeling for clients on an individual basis. We're doing financial plans for people. And we're showing them return assumptions for asset classes. And we're saying, like, emerging markets, this is our assumption. S&P 500, U.S. small cap, um, U.S. municipal bonds. Like, we're, we're giving people a framework for how to think about why we're bucketing their money the way we're doing it and how it's supposed to correspond with their future spending. We try to be very honest with people and say, look, we're making assumptions and the assumptions are based on history and history will not look precisely how um, it, it's, it's looked like, you know, the future will not look precisely how history. And I just feel like that kind of humility, it doesn't raise money. Like if you, <laughs> if you if if I run a TV commercial and I'm like, hi, I'm Josh Brown, and I have no fucking idea what's going to happen, like that's not the way Wall Street operates. Wall Street operates with certainty in mind. So there are some things that we feel pretty good about, which is that risk will ultimately be rewarded if it's an intelligent risk. So you say like stocks have given you seven percent real over the last fifty years, bonds have given you two percent or three percent real. And that relationship should hold over the next 50 years. I think I can reasonably say that because you're asking someone to take more risk. So they should be rewarded. But A, I can't say that over the next five years you'll be rewarded. 
Um, and so look, I think like having that approach to speaking with end clients and having that level of honesty um, in, in this day and age with this massive question that you and I are talking about hanging over all our heads, like I just feel like there are certain things that we should emphasize and maybe not worry so much about is 2020 the year value comes back or is 2022 the breaking point for large cap growth? Like I, I just think that question, while it's interesting, is so much less important than the, the real question, which is will these asset classes do what they're supposed to do going forward? And maybe that's like the bigger, more agonizing thing to think about. Do you adjust your forward projections for those different asset classes based on so valuation? So do you think you know if the stock market's expensive, it's likely that the forward return is lower? Um, we we are more apt to use things like inflation and um, to to have like a return assumption change than something like that. We are we are so we are not forecasting asset class returns based on valuation. Okay. Um, I, I, I know that there are, I know that there are legitimate, I know that there are legitimate ideas about let's take the Cape and let's use that not to make a one year forecast or a market timing call, but maybe to determine when an allocation should be higher or lower um, for a given asset. So like right now, if you're like a very Cape sensitive person, and by right now, I mean like over the last eight years. 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So you're saying like, well, it's reasonable to have less of a weighting to U.S. stocks because the 10-year outlook when CAPE is at these levels, I don't know if we have enough data to really do that. And that, by the way, that feeds into one of the things we were talking about, like what if everything's permanently changed? Um, well, what do you do in that scenario? I think you don't do anything. I think you stay disciplined about what you want your target weightings to be. You have volatility bands around those weightings so that you don't get blown out of, of an asset class just because there's been near-term volatility. But you don't screw around with your rebalancing. And when the time comes to trim from something, you do it. And when the time comes to add to something, you do it. And so much of that, it seems like easy and obvious. This is the stuff people will not do for themselves. They won't do it because you're asking them to buy into something as it's crashing in the largest amount you've ever asked them to buy into it and vice versa. You're asking them to take money off the table from whatever fund or asset class makes them feel great right now. Don't sell my Amazon, right? <laughs> like I mean, it, this is human nature. So like I think if you run a disciplined asset allocation strategy, you, you take your constitution seriously, meaning like like what you've used to constitute this portfolio, you've done a lot of work on what you want to own, how you want to own it, why, et cetera. Um, and then when it comes time to make trades for rebalancing, you do it thoughtfully, but you force yourself to do it. You're like ahead of 99% of the public just doing that. Like literally 99% of the public cannot do that for themselves or can only do it some of the time and not reliably enough. So if like you're just willing to stick to that and say you'll do that, you don't have to get the cape ratio shit right. Like you don't. It's it's unne it becomes unnecessary over enough of a period of time. According to your Wikipedia entry, you got your Series Seven in 1997, which, by my calculation, put you in college. What were yeah. you thinking? I well, my summer after ninth grade. Like I I grew up on Long Island, and in the 90s, everyone on Long Island was trying to be a stockbroker. That was just like it was like the. The, the, the road to riches. So people were studying for their Series 7s and getting internships at brokerage firms every summer, um, you know, in preparation for when when they graduated. Like, every, just everyone wanted to be involved with the market. It was the height of the 1990s bull market. People were just make, getting, getting absolutely filthy rich out of nowhere. Everyone was driving Porsches around. Um, and you'd be like, how did you make all this money to like a 24-year-old? And invariably they would say I'm a broker. So that's like the, the culture that existed when I was a teenager and like me and all my friends, we just were like, yeah, we're going to be brokers. It was like, very, it was, I know it sounds ridiculous now it's 20 years later, but like it was glamorous. That was like the thing that you wanted to aspire to. So, um, I, I took my series seven and I think I, I failed it the first time and then I passed it. <laughs> I mean, it's the dumbest test on earth. Like it's really, you know, it's it's not like passing the bar exam, believe me. 
uh, when I uh, when I first discovered you, it was like December two thousand and eight, which is when I started writing my blog. And I re- I just looked you up there. You you started blogging in November two thousand and eight. Yeah. Did you have any idea where it could go? No. Um, so I I started the blog like really just like venting. It was like the my blog started in between Lehman Brothers going bankrupt and right before like the Bernie Madoff revelation coming out that December. So it was just like a very fertile period of time to be ranting and raving about Wall Street. And I really didn't like, there was no like premeditated plan. It was just like, I have things to say. And at that time I had been uh, a retail broker. I hated the business. I hated everything that was happening in, in the markets. And I just, I had some things to get off my chest and uh, I found that audience really fast. And if I hadn't, I probably would have stopped because blogging is like a very demanding thing. Like if you're not putting up content every day, you, you, you're, you're gone basically. So, um, but people showed up. So I kept going. So you uh, started it as a result of the experiences that you had as a retail broker. And I, I, I uh, read uh, Backstage, Backstage Wall Street when it first came out in 2012. Thank and you. So my, uh, my, I haven't told you what I thought about it yet. <laughs> no, I thought it was, it, was, it was excellent. It was very, very good. But my, my impression of it was that it was something like, it was like working in Boiler Room or more, more, more recently, Wolf of Wall Street. So is, that, is, that, is that what it was like? So Yeah. So the, well, the Wolf of Wall Street era is before my time. That's really early 1990s. And by the time that I arrived in the brokerage business, that was already like on its way out. And what was really left was just people trying to do uh, retail business, legitimate retail business, buy and sell stocks and funds, but utilizing the techniques that the Wolf of Wall Street era people used. But they did not invent that. Cold calling was invented at Lehman Brothers. It was a, it was a guy by the name of Marty Shafaroff who wrote a book called Telephone Selling in the 90s. And he was either in the Madison Avenue office or the Water Street office of Lehman Brothers, which became infamous because they invented um, having brokers make 500 phone calls a day, call executives all over the country, and essentially sell stock to people that they had never met before in person. That was like an innovation at the time. But that's like the 60s and 70s. So cold calling culture had already been around for, which I talk about in the book, for 30 years prior to Jordan Belfort. Uh, He just, he was the first to take that concept and turn it toward nefarious purposes and like just build this empire of penny stocks where they controlled the prices and they made markets in all this the stocks that were being recommended prior to stratton oakmont cold calling was a perfectly legitimate way to do business development so after the stratton era that's where i came along there were still some people who were trained at stratton and they were running some of these brokerage firms so the idea was like let's get people to open accounts using legitimate investments, but let's use those old school tactics to, you know, get as many people as possible. So um, it was a unique moment. It it didn't last long. Um, Eventually people stopped picking up their phones, Uh, you know, but, but yeah, that was kind of the environment that, that I walked into. So we had like research analysts and we were trying to pick good stocks and they were all blue chips and liquid. Um, But yeah, the tactic was, how do we? How do you do business development? Use the phone, and I got really good at it. And that was not really my big issue. My big issue was just like realizing by the time the crisis rolled around, you say to yourself, like, all right, I got all these clients. I have all these people that believe in me. They like me. What the hell am I recommending to them? Like, this is none of this is helping them. And so that was kind of the um, epiphany that I had, where it was like, okay, the part I love about this business is helping people. The part I hate is the sales side. And so being able to divorce the sales side from the helping people side meant dropping my Series 7 and becoming an investment advisor. So that's kind of like the evolution of from where I started to where I where I ended up. And that was sort of the 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 focus and still is the focus of the reform broker blog that you talk about some of the abusive practices that they used to engage in and uh, better ways that the, the business can, can go. And that's, I'm guessing that's the reason that you linked up with Barry Ritholtz to form Ritholtz, right? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the stuff that I described in the book doesn't really exist anymore. There's probably 20 of those firms left. 
they're they're just they're gone. The the bigger abuses now that are interesting to me, um, you have a lot of people who are unregistered and they just every day have these extreme opinions. And I guess there's nothing you can do about it from a regulatory standpoint, but they have absolutely spent the last 10 years scaring people witless and causing people to either not invest or to invest in really, really poorly chosen asset allocations that virtually doom their um, proposition of retirement. Like if you missed most of the market over the last 10 years, you're never going to see a period like this again. Like, I don't know. How, how do you get those years back? So, I, like, I feel like that's the current abuse that is significantly more damaging to the invest the investor populace than anything Jordan Belfort ever did. Like, Jordan Belfort preyed on people who were greedy psychopaths to begin with for the most part. Like, you would not have given him a million dollars to steal from you if you didn't think that you found a shortcut to investing because of what he was doing. That put that aside, compartmentalize that. What's happening now, I think, is significantly more widespread and worse. And we have the First Amendment here. Like people are allowed to say whatever they want to say. Um, but I do think that there's this arbitrage uh, where people are like selling newsletters rather than becoming registered as investment professionals. And they are giving advice and it's shit advice and they're out of their fucking minds and they're, they're, they're scaring people out of investing for their retirement. And these people are not going to get this time back. So, you know, that, like to me, that's like an interesting abuse. And that's the kind of thing that I've been writing about lately to talk about like the old like boiler room brokerage days. Those days are gone. There's nobody left. So I, like I, I feel like the threat to the investor populace is always sh shifting. And I, I kind of. Um, I try, I think, to to help people with whatever the threat of the moment is. Well, well let's talk about that a little bit. So, wh what are you talking about? The the gold bugs, the uh, the doom, the doomsday guys. I just, yeah, just I feel like there are a lot of people who have no skin in the game, um, who are not. Look, if you're an unregistered person screaming about what you think the the stock market's about to do, or interest rates, or gold, you have the right to do that, but. If you manage no money, who gives a shit what you think? Like a lot of the loudest, most extreme voices um, are people that have no money at stake, have nothing at stake. They don't have any professional licensing. They don't have any. And so what I'm not saying is like they shouldn't be allowed to talk. Everyone should. Everyone has the right to talk. I think giving those people a platform, though, and then they lead thousands of, of unsuspecting average investors down the wrong path. I think that's like problematic. So I don't know what you can do about it other than to provide the counterbalance to that. Say, yes, we know that markets go down. Yes, we know that recessions happen. Yes, we know that very, very occasionally there are crashes. Um, but here's the context for all of that. And here's a more rational way of looking at the potential risks that you're taking, as opposed to um, the dollar is going to disappear in 18 months. Um, or the entire global financial system is about to become unglued and you're going to need like swords and spears to fight World War III like that. But they're like, that is what, that is what's being offered out there. Um, and you know, there's a huge audience for it. Uh, and, and that audience wants it, but then there are concentric circles around that audience. There are normal people being sucked into that. I know because we come across these people all the time and usually it's because they've blown up an account. Um, or several accounts and they're basically at this point like I don't know what to do I need to invest but I'm terrified um, so that's that's the, the role that I think we play in the in the uh, in the ecology of financial media I think we, we offer that counterbalance and we try to do it with evidence that that's that's Ritholtz or that's CNBC no no, no 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 that's that's my that's my gang um, but I, I think I bring that element to CNBC so uh, I'm on a show called The Halftime Report. Uh, it's a really interesting mix of some people are options traders, some people are hedge funds, some people are asset management. I'm the, I think I'm the only person in wealth management that's on my particular show. So that's the perspective I bring is, yes, I understand what's happening in the headlines. Here's our take on it. And uh, it's really, it's a privilege that, you know, they, they give me that opportunity to bring that perspective because... Uh, most of what's in financial TV is not people in wealth management. It's people that are in other aspects of Wall Street. So, 
So how did that come about? Because that was about five years after you started the Reform Broker blog. I think in about 2013, you started appearing on CNBC. What was the uh, process for, for, for... No, I, I made my first appearance in 2010. But in terms of like being a, a regular commentator, like a, a daily... I became a regular in 2011 when the halftime report um, first came about. And I'm not sure how that happened. I just got a call like, hey, we're doing this new thing at 12 o'clock. You want to be in? And, and uh, I said, yeah, I want to be in. So, and, you, and you've managed to stay in ever since, which is incredible. Well, yeah, you know, I, I'm doing, it seems like I'm on a lot more than I am. I'm doing a couple of days a week at this point. There were periods of time where I was doing more. Um, I don't know that I have that much to say to like be doing five days a week. Uh, and a lot of the things that I'm interested in that I talk about aren't fit for TV, which is why I maintain the blog. And, um, you know, there are, there are things that just, television wise would not be interesting, but that I find really interesting. So I try to write about that stuff. But then like the markets are are really my first love. Like I've always been interested in stocks and interested in how economic trends relate to the markets. And I just I love it. So uh, if they keep calling me, I'll keep uh, I'll keep appearing. I think it's I think it's a lot of fun. And it's a great way to reach a lot of people who would not ordinarily find me or read a blog, you know, mo like most civilians are not reading financial blogs. So if if you if you want to if you want to appear where people's attention is, that's where people's attention is. It's on financial television. So adapting my message to that audience is what what I try to do. And uh, I, you know I think I've done a pretty good job at it. The uh, the most amazing thing is that you've been able to sustain the output on the reform broker for so long. How do you do that? It's not easy. I, I think I think you have to just be reading a lot at all times to be a blogger. Like I don't know that there are I don't know that there are any good financial blogs written by people who aren't constantly reading. And sometimes you're reading other people's blogs just to get a sense of what they're saying. But a lot of the time you're reading the news of the day or you're reading research. And I think you have to be comfortable with the idea that you don't know what you're gonna write about wanna write about tomorrow. Or the next day, things are just going to have to occur to you in the course of your reading, which is why you need to do a lot of reading. So if you didn't love the subject matter, it would be really hard to maintain a blog. So the thing I tell people is that, like, I don't have a lot of hobbies. Like, there's a few things I do outside of finance, but I do spend a ton of time reading. And that's where a lot of the ideas of what I'm going to write about come from. And if you're not somebody that's just constantly curious and wanted to read, it's going to be hard to do a blog because like you might have three or four good ideas up front, but then what, like, what are you going to say next week? What are you going to say the week after? I'm fairly confident that at this point, it's like almost 11 years. I'm fairly confident that I'm going to keep reading things and things are going to keep occurring to me. And it doesn't mean like my takes are so great all the time, but every once in a while I will put a few things together from a, a wide variety of sources I'm reading and I will write something that I'm like really proud of, but that's not every day. You have to be willing to go almost every day and then understand that most of what you write will not be remembered. You just have to be willing to, to go through that process. I mean, we hope that most of the things that we write aren't remembered. Yeah, it's quite better off than me. Uh, but I, I, think, um, I think the best financial bloggers are the people that aren't trying to specifically hold to a schedule but they're people that when something occurs to them, like they're willing to drop other shit and sit down and, and write it. And that's not always easy for everyone to do, right? Like if, if, if you have a nine to five job and you have like phones ringing and people that you're supposed to be answering to and you have this really great thought occur to you, like it's hard. It's like, like I feel like you have to be like in an advantageous place to even begin the process of blogging. Now for me, I was effectively out of business. So it's not like I was like brave and courageous and I was like, no, put all that work to the side. I'm going to do my blog now. Nobody fucking wanted to talk to me when I started. Like I, I was a retail, think about what it meant to be a retail broker a month after Lehman goes down. So even like your blue chip stocks are cut in half, right? Like even the best mutual funds that you would recommend to people, they're down 30, 40% from the peak. The only people who want to talk to you want to yell at you. And as far as like going out and finding new clients, like that is not a thing that's happening at that moment in American history. People 
they either want their money in cash or they know exactly where it is and they, and they will not move it. No one's moving money to anyone else. So there's this like six month window in time from let's say the fall of 08 through the summer of 09 where the market is a race 20 years worth of gains or, or 15 years worth of gains and I have nothing else going on in my life. Like my career is, uh, it's it. Like I have my clients, they don't want to talk to me and I have no investment ideas. The market was just going to zero at that time. So it was like a very advantageous window. If, if I tried to start a blog now from scratch, it would never happen. I just don't, I don't have time. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's something that I try to like be really honest about is that a lot of things fell into place at the right time for me to begin. Um, I think now it's much harder, harder to get attention for something new that you're starting, uh, harder to build an audience. And if you're in a position of success right now in the industry, like when, when the hell would you have the time to do that? So um, I was very fortunate to have started when I did, and I don't think uh, I would be able to do what I've done if I were starting today. What about a forum like Twitter, which is uh, microblogging was what they used to call it. I don't know if anybody still says that anymore, but it's um, you're forced to condense your views down. You can get them out much faster. I, I sort of prefer that method to sitting down and writing very long form blog posts. And you, you've got probably the biggest following in FinTwit by a mile, probably one of the biggest followings on, on Twitter. So it's clearly something that you're good at. Do you enjoy that as much as you enjoy blogging? So I think that Twitter prizes three things. The first is timeliness, which on a blog you don't have to do. In fact, you shouldn't. You should go the other way. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. So timeliness is the number one thing that Twitter prizes, which is why journalists love it, especially financial journalists. Um, the second thing that Twitter prizes is outrage. So if you can say something that upsets a lot of people, you will get a lot of attention. You might not like that attention, but that's how it's done. But the third thing is wit. So if you can say entertaining, intelligent, funny things in short, sharp bursts, and remember, I started when it was 140 characters, <laughs> so it's right. twice as hard. No, but if, if you can entertain and you can say very clever, like almost like, you know who would have fucked shit up on Twitter? Oscar Wilde. Yeah. Like you, you, Google, you Google the one-liners of Oscar Wilde there's almost no maybe like maybe Twain is up there, but like the list is very short. Um, if you if if you think if you think about like somebody like that with with Twitter at their disposal, they would have gotten to millions of followers. Well, his right? books are written that way, right? His books are written every single line is set up punchline, set up punchline. I don't know how he does right. it. So that, so that's a skill. So those all right. So people are like, well, how do you do Twitter well? Well. I just gave you the three key things and then you decide in what mixture you want to incorporate them. So timeliness. Are you saying something that people care about right this second? Um, outrage. Can you say things to manipulate people's feelings you know, in a positive or negative way? Um, and, and, and wittiness. Are you funny? If, you, if the answer to those three things is, yeah, I can do that stuff, well then the bigger picture is how much time you want to devote to it. Because saying one witty thing every two weeks, you're not going to build a following. Now, you might not give a shit. There's, believe it or not, uh, Tobias, there are people in this world that don't care about their Twitter following. I don't know who those people are, but they, they have, my wife is one of them. Apparently, those people exist. But if you care, Twitter is like part of your, your job. Like You've got to do it that way. Um, now, it's not necessary. But I'm saying if you really want to do it, it's like it's every day. And one of the things I've done – one of the things I've done that people don't understand, like, how, how do you have so much time to tweet? Like, I'd say a third of my tweets were scheduled that morning throughout the day. And so it creates, it creates like this ubiquitous, like appearance, like, oh my God, this guy's all over the place. Not really, not really. Like, I, if you take advantage of scheduling tools, and I do this for LinkedIn and for Facebook too, you can make sure that at all times you have content being put out there and you don't have to be around. So I, I think I've done a pretty good job at that and staying disciplined at that. Um, not a lot of people take the time to do that. Uh, it would go a long way if they did. You've also uh, done a lot of podcasting. So you guys have The Compound and you and Michael have a regular uh, back and forth, which is excellent, which is sort of a little bit like 
uh, almost like CNBC style with the little uh, sideboard that gives you the topics that are coming up. Do you find that that adds an extra element? Does it add we something stole, different? We, we stole that from ESPN, not CNBC. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I think that uh, look if if somebody gave a if somebody gave a show, I'm like I mean this with all respect to to everyone. If somebody gave a show to pe- not me, but like people that are financial bloggers, and just said, take the conversation that's happening on FinTwit and financial blogs and podcasts and do a 30 minute show about the highlights. Like that would be the highest rated show on any network. I mean, no one's going to do it. Um, but like if somebody did that, and maybe like the version that Michael and I do, but maybe the version Michael and Ben do is better. I, I don't know. Like it, that's not like that to me. It's so obvious, but no one will do it. I don't know why no one will do it. But like what we're trying to do is say these are the conversations that investors are having, professional and amateur investors are having. And some of it's based on research. Some of it's based on articles. Some of it's like somebody did a really great podcast interview and that conversation spills out onto the blogs and onto Twitter and everyone has their say and everyone has takes and there are great takes and bad takes. That's what we're trying to um, serialize. Like every week that's happening and then we're kind of doing these recaps like, hey, did you hear this? Did you read that? I think we do a pretty good job at it. There's obviously an audience for it. Um, I don't know how mainstream that audience would be. Like it's probably mostly financial advisors and ETF industry people and traders, but whatever. Like we're we're trying to do that, and it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun with it. There's nothing like it that exists in in the mainstream media. Like I feel like our content is purely a creature of um, social media, and that's fine. You know, we have a lot of fun. It's a much more informal uh, format than you see on television. I think for that reason, it's better because it's a little bit more authentic. The back and forth. Some, I mean, sometimes we don't have as good graphics. We don't have as good flashing <laughs> lights. Um, you know, if we had a little bit more of a production budget, maybe it would be Do you think that would make it better? Do you think that would make it better? I don't know. Maybe not. I, I'm just going to – for the record, for the record, um, my – like of my, ten, of my 10 favorite podcasts, even if I didn't work with these guys, I would honestly say this. Of my ten, And I listen to a ton of podcasts. Of my 10 favorite – Two of them are people that I work with, or three of them are people I work with. So, so Michael and Ben, Animal Spirits, I think is the best. Like I think it's number one, and I have nothing to do with it. Like literally, I've never been on it. I don't write it. I don't. I don't get. I give them an idea every once in a while, but they they have created this entire thing by themselves. Every single financial advisor under forty is listening to this podcast. They are so influential that I don't even think the rest of the world knows it yet. But when it becomes apparent how influential these guys are, forget it. Like, it's just going to explode. So I, even if I had never met either of them, I would be obsessed with that show. And then Barry's podcast, Barry's my partner, like full disclosure. Like, I work with him and we're friends. But it doesn't matter. You cannot deny that Barry's interviews with the top investment people of all time who are alive currently and name somebody, he's done it, like – He's done it all. Coop, uh, Cooperman, Dalio. Uh, who, I mean, who hasn't he had, right? Chanos two times uh, and on and on and on. There's no one doing that. There is nobody doing long form um, hour and a half interviews with the top investment figures in the world and not asking them a single question, a single question about what they think is going on right now. Like not one time is he sitting – across from an investor and being like, what do you think interest rate is going to do next week? It's, it's, that, there's enough of that. That exists already. Barry's like, how did you get started? Like, how did your career, like what you were doing with me? That content is so unique. It's shocking that no one else is, is trying to do it. So he has that all to himself. So if somebody's like, well, what financial media do you think is good or what do you pay attention to? Well, a lot. But in terms of podcasts, even if you, even if you fucking hate me, you have to agree with me that what Barry is doing is incredible and what Michael and Ben are doing, it's incredible. Now, there's others I listen to. I love Meb show. Um, I listen to your show. I listen to uh, uh, Corey Hofstein when he puts out a season. I try to understand what's going on there. Maybe it's a little bit over my head. Um, I listen to like a lot of the – and I just think what's going on in podcasts right now in our space 
is really, really exciting. And it's more exciting than what's being written, like what's in print right now. I, pod, I feel like the podcast is where everything's happening. 100% agree. And that's, uh, that's full time. Thanks so much, Josh Brown, Reform Broker. Let's do it one more time, Tobias. I just want to make sure we get this whole thing. <laughs> well, this is take two, right? Question, question one, begin. <laughs> <laughs> Will value outperform the market over the next 10 years? Uh, I hope it does. We'll do a reunion podcast 10 years from now. Sounds good. Is that good. a deal? All right. Perfect. Thanks, man. Josh Brown, thanks so much.